Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Joel Kinman finds himself behind bars as the Informer. Pete Koslow, played by Joel Kinman, is on parole and works as a mole in the Polish mob for the FBI, handled by Rosamund Pike's Agent Wilcox and her boss Montgomery, played by Clive Owen. When undercover NYPD officer Daniel Gomez, played by Arturo Castro, dies in a deal gone bad, the mob's boss, Klemek, known as the General, played by Eugene Lipinski, wants Koslow to go back into Bale Hill Prison so he can bring in fentanyl for them. Wilcox and Montgomery agree to this, knowing it will get the evidence to finally bring down the General. But when Gomez's partner Grenz, played by Common, follows the trail to the FBI, Coslo's safety is jeopardised. The Informer is based off the 2009 book Three Seconds, written by Scandi Noir writers Rosalind Hellstrom. In fact, it's one of a series of books, all of which featuring the character of Grenz, played in the film version by Common. And you would think, hearing that, that the intention here would be to kick off a whole series of adaptations, but that genuinely doesn't appear to be the case. It only seems like the producers got the rights to this one book in particular, and then transplanted it to the screen, taking the storyline and a couple of the characters, and otherwise relocating it to New York. It definitely seems like they were trying to avoid a snowman situation in this case, which I can't blame them to be honest. And this is a US-UK co-production with a fairly good pedigree. It's got a very solid cast. It's directed by actor-turned-director Andrea De Stefano, who previously directed Escobar Paradise Lost. And one of the production companies that worked on this is Thunder Road, who are best known for the Sicario films and the John Wick series. And yet, despite that, it's been kicked around the schedule repeatedly in both the US and the UK, it finally escaped into British cinemas at the very tail end of August, but if you're in the US, you'll have to wait until January to now see it. And the reason for this is usually because it's a bad movie, especially if you're kicking things around in August or January, notorious dumping ground months. But in the case of The Informer, having seen it, that isn't really the issue. It's not a bad movie. It does genuinely seem like the actual problem with the film is that it isn't particularly remarkable in any distinguishable way. When we first meet Kinnaman's Coslow at the beginning of this movie, he's stitching a wire into the fabric of his clothing while simultaneously juggling phone calls with his FBI hand, the Wilcox, and his Polish mob associates. And this establishes that he lives his life on a knife edge. He's always in a precarious situation because he's always at the whim of external forces. He never really knows if if his identity as an informant is going to be exposed at any given moment. And so there's this constant uncertainty and tension there. And if something does happen to him, if he is in genuine danger, if his life is on the line, he knows that he has to rely only on his wits and ingenuity. He may be working for the FBI, but they're not in a position where they're going to burst down the door to try and save him. He knows that he's a disposable burnable asset. The informer is at its best when it takes advantage of that, which is why one of the best stretches of the movie is actually the whole opening section of it. Coslow, at the beginning of the film, looks like he might be getting out of this world. He just has to do this one job, this one assignment that will take all these guys down, and hopefully he might get a new life for himself and his family at the end of it. And yet, as it progresses, you realise that not only is he not going to get a chance to escape this world, it's in fact pulling him back in deeper and deeper and deeper, and especially in the sequence where he confronts the undercover cop, and the moment where they're talking to each other, and he realises who he's talking to, and the situation they're in is genuinely intense, especially the way that he tries to negotiate the situation to an extent that the cop can walk out with his life intact without exposing both their covers, and even though I knew what the outcome of this was going to be, because obviously I was aware of what the plot was, the hairs on the back of my neck were still standing up. There's a genuine sense of jeopardy to the way this whole thing is staged, and I do have to 
to stress how much the Informer really does start very strongly, but it doesn't manage to keep that energy up. It finds this tension in pockets every so often, but never consistently so, which really is a shame. I do think, for his efforts, Kinnaman actually does quite well in this part. He made his name on television with the killing, but on film, he's never quite found the right role. In fact, he's been quite badly miscast in things like the Robocop remake or in Suicide Squad, where he failed to make any real kind of impression. And here, I think that he's likeable and affable enough that he convinces, as a family man, that you root for him, but also has that toughness that he convinces when he's behind bars or he's working for the mobsters. So he works on that level. It's just not the kind of breakout role that Kinman really needs to find. It's just a very workmanlike performance in a lot of ways, but I do think that Kinnaman does his best with the material that he's been given. What hurts the informer is that it simply gets mired in its own plotting and it allows that early tension to dissipate far too quickly. A more disciplined adaptation would have realised they should focus their attention on the central figure of Coslo because he's got the most cinematic storyline, instead of trying to turn it into an ensemble like its source material because they'll just end up being cluttered. And that's precisely what happens. You end up following multiple characters in different strands of the storyline that are meant to converge together at the very end of it. But it doesn't really work. It feels like your attention is being pulled too many different ways at the same time. And I was watching it thinking, why do they adapt this to a film when it would have worked very well on television? There's a lot of Scandi Noir adaptations in that format. And there's a reason for that. It's because those tales typically are very interwoven. And when you've got multiple episodes, you can focus on different elements of the storyline so that when they do eventually come together towards the end of it, it feels satisfying. The informer fails to pull that trick off. And it really does feel like they haven't taken advantage of the fact that film has a very finite running time and you have to limit your focus. And so what ends up happening is that none of them feel particularly well developed. You've got the FBI storyline with Wilcox and Montgomery and they're trying to cover up their involvement with the whole undercover cop because obviously if it's discovered that the FBI had any involvement with that it's going to be very very bad for all involved. The problem with that storyline is that it doesn't feel especially credible and it don't really help that I don't think those characters are especially well written or well performed in the case of Clive Owen. I think that Owens Montgomery really is a very kind of paycheck performance from the actor. He very much delivers the role with a kind of smarminess that you would expect but feels very much like a cliche bad guy. The second that he appears on screen, you know that he's an antagonist because he's literally antagonizing Coslo really aggressively for no particular reason. It's actually one of the worst Clive Owen performances I think I've seen in recent memory. He just doesn't feel like a real person. And I like Rosamund Pike, who seems to have made her name recently in middle brow thrillers like this one, but even here she seems a bit faintly miscast. There's a scene where Owen talks to her very condescendingly about the days where he was young in the FBI. I sat at that desk over there and it sounds like it should be directed at someone much younger than him as opposed to Pike who is only a couple of years younger than Clive Owen is. It really doesn't make sense especially considering that Pike's Wilcox is meant to go through a crisis of conscience and so you're not really sure in the second half of the movie where her allegiances truly lay whether she's actually going to sell out this man to forward her own career in the same way that her own boss is doing. And so that kind of conflict, that kind of going up against her own idealism, again, would have worked better with someone maybe slightly younger in the part. You've also got Andy Armas as Kinnaman's wife, and she tries to add a little bit of spine and resiliency to what is essentially a nothing part. I feel like I've seen De Armas so many times cast in roles playing the girlfriend or the wife of the main character that exists solely to be under threat for the majority of the running time and then be captured in time for the finale over and over again. Forgettable roles in forgettable movies like Overdrive, for example. And yeah, there are a couple of exceptions to that, like Blade Runner 
Roadrunner 2049, but it really does feel like Diarmus is squandered in these kind of roles, and someone really needs to actually give her a part that she can actually do something with. You do see the odd flash of it in her performance, especially when she confronts Common for the first time, and she's very skeptical of him and doesn't trust him in any way. That seems like a moment where she's actually given a little bit to do with the character, but otherwise she exists solely to be essentially just an element of jeopardy all throughout the running time. Speaking of common, you've also got Grenz going through the narrative, and essentially this is more actually a dual protagonist narrative, because Grenz actually sort of takes over a lot of the movie once Coslow is behind bars. He's the one who's more actively investigating. He's the one that tries to help out once he realizes what exactly a hornet's nest he's made to get himself into, but it ends up dividing the focus. Kinnaman ends up being a side figure under pressure and forces beyond his own control or even knowledge related to what Common's doing in his storyline. And when I put it all like that, you can understand why after that opening stretch, the first act of this film is a real slog because it's having to establish all these different characters and motivations. There's so much exposition being thrown at you. It simply takes far too long to really get going. It's only about 45 minutes in, just around the halfway point, does Kinnaman finally return to the prison that he was paroled from in the first place, which is meant to be the core conceit of the film. And it's almost too late by that point to really do that much with it, especially because the movie doesn't help itself by cutting away so often away from Kinnaman to other storylines, which undermines the tension of that environment. I wanted to stick with Kinnaman because obviously he's in way over his head. He feels trapped. He doesn't know who to trust or who's going to shiv him in the back. And there are some good moments every so often. There's a really rough and ready fight sequence at one point. And I like the detail that the prison is established in terms of the production design because Coslo's bunk is actually in a converted gym. All the excess bunk are in there because the prison is so overcrowded. There's a real kind of cynicism and grimness to the way the prison is established in this film. Although I will say in terms of the location work, it's not entirely convincing. They shot the prison sequences in the UK and you can very much tell if you're familiar with what a British prison looks like, that's exactly what you see on screen. It doesn't entirely convince as being a prison in America. It genuinely doesn't. But aside from that, I just wish the movie focused more on this element of the story, and it just doesn't feel like it properly takes advantage of the suspense that you could get out of this kind of scenario. By the time the third act rolls around, the wheels on the informer are starting to come off. It takes a sharp nosedive in terms of its credibility. The film tries to stage a simultaneous action climax, one for Grenz and one for Coslo, and try to maintain attention by cross-cussing between them. And I will say, the one for Grenz works really well, that home invasion shootout, because it's very contained and controlled. There's a lot of moments where the tension is just allowed to build. It's really nail-biting and doesn't feel very Hollywood, because you really do get the sense that someone innocent is going to die. On the other hand, you have Coslo who tries to stage a prison breakout, and that feels wildly implausible. As soon as that happens, it just turns into a very, very silly movie. There's a prison riot, there's helicopters, the police are called in, there's snipers, an explosion happens. It all gets very, very over the top, which really does not work for this movie. And then afterwards, there's a really genuinely puzzling bit of editing. There's a moment where they decide to skip ahead in the action, but it feels like they've done too far because when they cut away to the next scene, it's not immediately clear what has actually happened. And that's not what you want to do when you do that kind of moment. It genuinely feels like they ran out of budget and they just decided to skip over a couple of pages of the script because it would have been too hard to stage. 
stage. It feels like that rather than an organic moment. And it has the sense about this movie's resolution that isn't wholly satisfying in a way that you can't put your finger on very easily. But I think it might be because there's one major element of the plot, one key reason why Coslo went back into prison in the first place that isn't entirely resolved or clarified by the time the credits roll. And it adds this sense that there really wasn't that much accomplished by the time the film ends. It's pretty easy to see why the film's US distributor has so much cold feet about it because the informer feels like the kind of middle brow thriller that about 10 to 15 years ago were done moderate business at the box office, but now in today's crowded theatrical marketplace will struggle to find any kind of audience. And that's not a put down of the film it itself it's just that it's very very adequate and there are moments where it shines and you can sort of see a better version of it i definitely at certain points thought of sicario especially in the way that you have a protagonist that ends up being caught in a web of bureaucracy and corruption above their control that puts them directly into danger but it's not nearly as smart or incisive as that film it doesn't have the same level of political commentary or really the same kind of tension everything about it is watchable but not particularly remarkable in any real way and so it's the kind of film that will have a very very short life in cinemas but may work well on streaming as something to just throw on for a couple of hours but otherwise it's very forgettable. The Informer works as a nuts and bolts crime thriller where no one can be trusted but never excels itself. In the film's best moments, it has real tension as Kinman plunges ever deeper into danger, especially in the film's opening stretch. However, this is diluted by overly convoluted plotting with several interconnected storylines that takes far too long to establish, only getting into the meat of the return to prison premise around halfway through, not giving it enough time to be fully exploited. The ensemble cast do their best, but some roles are too thin or simplistic to do much with, Anna Diarmas is a wife in peril and Clive Owen's shady FBI boss in particular, and even Kinnaman feels lost in the shuffle when Common shares duties as the protagonist. The movie's action-heavy finale starts to stretch credibility as it tries to tie everything together, but the informer has moments where it shows it could have been great if ultimately settling for watchable but forgettable. If you'd like this review, then I'd like to inform you of my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early among other perks, including access to my Discord server, but until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.